The purpose of this video is to go through different options when it comes to making portables uh, to give some uh, insight for uh, people new to the hobby. These are two examples of cases. Um, this was made with standard Tupperware and this was made by vacuum forming. You can of course also as a third option make a case out of um, for example um, any casing from a toy or something that you have lying around that would be the right size. This is Tupperware, a standard lunchbox. If you have two of these identical ones and cut them to the same height then of course it means that both halves when put together will meet in the same places. The tops of these are not particularly strong and they do give a fair bit so it makes sense to remove this whole section put in a flat piece of um, styrene or perspex and glue it into place. You then end up with a nice strong case that as this example from our Dreamcast portable um, it works, it's flat, it's smooth and you get a nice end finish. The other option as mentioned is with vacuum forming which of course means that you can make the case to whatever shape and size and dimensions as required and can therefore get a very attractive end result. The methods and options of course of all these parts are mentioned on the WordPress site and on the forum. If you want to uh, learn more specifics, um, the information is to hand. There's, um, there's two normal options here for painting. One is to use spray paint and one is to use, the, which I prefer to be quite frank, um, a small pot of paint and a paint roller. Um, this gives a nice smooth finish with a spray painting however you've got to make sure that absolutely every part of the surface um, is completely blemish free and completely smooth because it will show up any um, site defects. Also it takes quite a long time to dry if you put several coats on uh, it needs to uh, basically set nice and strong uh, before you then apply some varnish to make the surface less prone to be uh, scratched and to wear off and the process does take quite a long time however spray paint is very handy for for example um, repainting some of the buttons and the controls if required I say preferred option with the paint roller because it's much more tolerant for the things that I've mentioned um, being a thicker coat of paint uh, you, you do get a very slight texture which I think looks, uh, looks very nice, very attractive but also it fills in any minor blemishes um, very quick and easy to apply literally just a small mini paint roller run it all over the place give it two or three layers and then again use some varnish that's designed for paint in effect you're applying a thicker surface that's quite quick to dry and um, therefore in my view gives a much better result much easier result than having to um, paint, notice where you've got a tiny scratch mark that needs to be filled perhaps putting in too much spray paint and then it, it bubbling on the side uh, some people are good at it, I prefer the easy method, the result looks very similar very slight texture exactly as, uh, as you'd have on your domestic walls but um, very easy to apply sanding paper and sanding tools um, as mentioned you can have the um, Circular cutters are sanding, sanding tools and that for the Dremel, that's great. But if you want to do a larger area, these sheets are ideal when you want to sand the bottom of a case to make sure it's all nice and flat. You see this had a fair bit of usage. You can get them in various um, thicknesses of grit. Um, good idea to start with a slightly thicker one, like a medium one. And then uh, when it's reasonably correct, then go for a fine grain sand. Um, and these sanding blocks you can buy them very cheaply um, again car boot sales, DIY stores, wherever the reason that these are good is that they are bendable you can make them into slightly different shapes so if you wanted to sand non-flat surfaces they're absolutely ideal and also because they have a bit of give it means that you can sand something on the top and um, it won't be expecting the surface to be completely flat as you've got here in order to do a, a sand even though it's a slight angle it will still perform a sanding process again this one's had a lot of usage um, I've got a big box of these things but um, you do find when you've been using them for a bit of time like this one 
but you actually end up with a very very smooth fine finish so it's good for finishing work of course they arrive a fair bit rougher these are indispensable so they're very cheap items but um, I really would suggest that, uh, that you get some of these so on to batteries um, don't bother with AA batteries or AAA batteries uh, they are very expensive to run and they are not much use in a portable in occasion you might want to use one as an alternative for the battery supply NIMH batteries rechargeable but they don't last very long uh, they also discharge very quickly as well by up to about 30% over the course of a week and that's without even using them so frankly don't worry about those either this is one I got off eBay in good faith that uh, the Chinese supplier was selling me a 6 amp 12 volt supply well they're not uh, they don't last very long they're rubbish go for the lithium polymer or the Lion batteries I like to use these, um, these Lion batteries um, that's a standard generic Canon uh, BP911 or 915 battery they're both the same these can be um, nice generic bought from China ones work really really well they contain their own battery protection circuit up here inside um, plus two of these batteries which is what's inside here combined gives you your 7.4 volts and typically a pack of that size will give you 2 amps but of course you can um, link these together in parallel and get more amperage another example of the same battery this has got four inside instead of the two um, otherwise it's the same principle you could of course however just get more of these and attach them to the circuit in place um, make sure of course you're wiring them all uh, exactly as they should be um, and again there's another supporting video I did a while ago which illustrates uh, how to do that so these are the ones that I use as choice they might be thicker um, but they seem to be stable and reliable and therefore uh, I tend to use them in order to do any case making you need a tool for doing uh, hole cutting and the Dremel is a very good tool for doing that it's got plenty of torque and um, it's a good quality well made um, tool I've used one or two um, uh, unbadged ones and even the first time I tried to cut some metal with one of them there was uh, smoke coming out from the motor not particularly a good sign Dremels are very good the type you get doesn't really matter um, go for one that can take um, 15,000 RPM and also 30,000 RPM you can go for fancier ones but that's a good minimum you also need various tools uh, attachments these are sanding drums which are fantastic for doing buttonholes and also for cutting along the sides of uh, systems and you can get them as a 12 millimeter um, as a 10 and uh, also as a 6 mil uh, so try and get all three sizes if you can this is a good attachment um, it's called a chuck and it makes it very very easy to um, put in new ends as we've got down here and uh, different thicknesses to um, change them quite quickly and efficiently you also need some cutting wheels like this which uh, are good for cutting through boards and cutting through metal um, and some general ruffle sanding tools you see these have had quite a lot of usage I've got, um, I've got replacements but um, apparently it's best to replace them when you need to and um, you also need a variety of small drill bits that's a 2mm one uh, I tend to suggest that people go for a 1mm a 1.5 a 2mm and uh, if your Dremel can take it a 3mm as well that sort of covers most of the bases you can also get these in a variety of other shapes they tend to come with different bits and bobs uh, depending on the packs that you buy um, but again different applications they can be quite useful but if you need to buy them individually I would really suggest that you go for the sanding drums and um, you go for some general cheap bits you don't have to spend a lot of money on them car boot cells are ideal for for those sorts of things and also you can get these additional Dremel parts as well which uh, come in a variety of ends basically it's just a different way of sanding different size holes so try and get a variety if you can if you're looking on eBay um, just do a search on Dremel bits 
and it should come up with quite a variety. They don't obviously have to be Dremel, any brand you get uh, will be fine and try and go for relatively cheap ones. I did get some metal circular cutters. Um, I have found though in reality that unless you're trying to cut through um, a particularly stubborn piece of metal that these don't actually have any more benefit in real terms than the standard circular cutters that we refer to. There's also a slightly larger version which is a little bit more durable, a little bit tougher but also a little bit thicker. Hot glue of course is quite a good popular favourite. The problem with it is that um, it does melt with relatively low temperatures and uh, also it does have a little bit of give when it's uh, when it's dry. It's not uh, not a solid adhesion. Uh, even if you prepare the surfaces properly, which of course uh, you should do, because material like styrene does need to be sanded first before it will take glue properly. Another concept is to use these. Um, these aren't glue per se, they're more of a mould, of, of a weld, in that it um, does very slightly melt the plastic itself, so when you bond the two layers together um, you've got a very good strong bond. However, it only works on some materials. It usually works on styrene fine, and it does also work with plastic beads, um, but a much stronger bond, of course, is with super glue. Now this works well. Um, I've been using it quite a bit. Um, this is just one I bought off a car boot sale, a very sort of cheap generic one, but it does the job very well uh, for plastic, uh, wood, cardboard, and uh, it does the job. Um, just be careful of course that you don't end up gluing your fingers together. Um, so a lot of people tend to use hot glue. Um, I think it's fair to say though that once you've had experience of using it you realise it's great for doing things like securing wires that you've soldered onto a board um, but not for anything to do with construction with a case. Really super glue is the best option for that. It's permanent. It also um, only has a problem at much higher temperatures than, uh, than this as well. This is the type of solder that you get in the UK. We used to have the leaded type but they don't sell that term anymore. Um, this previous one is reported to uh, um, make much better solder joints but I presume health and safety whatever. Anyway this is what you get these days. If you put, want to remove any solder from, um, for example, an old cartridge or you've just put down too much solder in error, you can use a desoldering bulb. However, personally, I found that these are much better. It's a braid. And uh, as you see, the little flays of metal. And the idea is that you put this up against um, the solder that you want to remove, apply it to your um, soldering iron, and then as you see, the solder gets sucked up into the uh, braid and therefore it gets removed. The other indispensable item is flux. Uh, again, very cheap item to buy. It's like a fairly thick paste and uh, you can ply it with basically whatever you want. I just tend to use one of these cotton buds and then dab it and then pop it onto the, um, onto the copper trace. When you then put some solder onto your iron and apply it to the place, you'll find that the solder attaches and then you can make some good strong solder joints. This is just an old holder for the um, soldering iron. Uh, the ones I use, they're 30 watt and pencil pointed and they're very cheap ones I get off eBay. These cost about 5 or 6 pounds each and they do the job very well. Um, I don't tend to take a, a great deal of care with my irons, so um, buying cheap ones is probably the best options for, for me. Um, sponges, very cheap. Again, they don't last forever, um, but they only cost a, a small amount to replace. Or you could just use a, a, a kitchen cleaning sponge if you preferred. Uh, it doesn't have to fit into, into a, one of these recesses. It's a good selection of uh, speakers from different for different types of sources. PlayStation 1 screen, uh, this is one I got off eBay. Um, this audio is quite good, but as you see, it's got quite a thick backing on it. Um, this is off uh, mobile phone compatible MP3 player type 1, but uh, you generally get the same type of speakers off little iPod players. Um, this one, a little bit bigger, also a lot flatter. 
and 30 millimeter ones here same type of principle the smaller the speaker the tinnier the sound and of course the less volume before you get distortion um, but any of these these types are perfectly adequate for doing a portable it comes down to what you can get hold of and of course personal choice so regards plastics there's um, two different types that I find quite useful one is plastic card which is also called styrene this is two millimeter thick and it's ideal for doing vacuum forming but also it's a very good general purpose plastic um, because it's strong it's flat and also if you score it it's very easy to break um, and consequently it makes it very easy to utilize and it's very adaptable the other material is this clearer material which is perspex which you remem may remember was highlighted when showing how to mount these buttons because it's much easier to see what you're doing with this style than of course with an opaque surface however it's much harder to cut with uh, a dremel or any other material it's also very much more messier too so pros and cons general stuff I tend to use this for so more specific applications I use a perspex for wiring um, use 3 amp or 6 amp cable household cable for anything to do with power in other words um, connecting batteries for the negative and also the positive lines good idea to have different colors if you're using different voltages it just keeps life easy you need some very flexible wire for doing things like cart relocation um, however this wire is only good for up to a certain length I think it's sort of six or eight inches depending on what type you're using before you get too much interference on the lines and it uh, stops games loading or controllers working properly as they should if you want to go longer than that then it's best using the wires that you have in your controllers um, because those are shielded and a good example is within an existing project I'm working on where I have a cable running this entire distance to get to the button controls um, the grounding inside the cable itself has been grounded into the system and um, therefore interference is very heavily reduced and this is precisely why you can run cables up to um, I think it's 100 meters before um, you get into problems which is of course far better than the standard 6 or 8 inches that you have with uh, unprotected wires like this so heat sinking and cooling um, the processes on many of these old systems can get quite hot so the common process is to put a tiny tiny blob of uh, thermal adhesive paste um, barely enough to even register and then wipe it along with an old credit card or a piece of cardboard so that all of the surface is, um, is covered the only idea of the thermal paste is to basically get inside any tiny grooves and crevices so that the heat dissipates evenly um, you don't want to have a thick layer on there it's as thin as you can get away with and then of course you apply a heat sink um, you can get them in quite a variety of ways even from old computers and, uh, and boards um, if there's any gunk left on it just use a cloth and wipe it off otherwise when that's in place apply a tiny blob of um, super glue onto the corner so it doesn't go onto the pins a very very small amount and then when you attach it on it will then stay permanently that's all that's required for heat sinking you also then need to cool because there's no point having a heat sink if the warm air can't escape um, a normal style of fan like this is absolutely adequate they come as either 5 volts or 12 volts depending on uh, which ones you go for and some can be nice and thin like this and others much thicker and of course different sizes as well given the low heat that um, systems like the N64 generate frankly any fan will, will do the job absolutely fine make sure that there's uh, space in the top of your system for air to, to release because of course warm air rises and cold air drops as we all know so therefore if you've got some little holes for ventilation um, the warm air can escape very easily people seem to find uh, cart relocation are one of the harder aspects to modding so in order to um, make the process 
a little easier to uh, to to perform. Um, I tend to look at this in its most basic element. You've got the game cartridge port that would normally sit onto its corresponding pins. So all you're actually doing is to extend the distance by using wires um, up to six inches, perfectly uh, perfectly adequate in most cases, and you're literally just connecting the correct pin to its place on the board. Now one little technique which I find quite handy is to wire up one series of pins this way and then when you turn it backwards you've then got full access to the other section and to these pins. It saves fiddling about with trying to work out what goes where. Once you've got the first pin wired into its correct position then you can just carry along, do the rest of the row and then as mentioned turn it over and do the other half. Keeps it very very simple. On the N64 board it doesn't matter if you wire to the front or to the back because the pins of course have contact on both sides of the board. Uh, not all systems will um, be easy to do that but they will all um, allow you to wire onto either side so it's really a case as to which is the most convenient for your application. So when making your cases, um, one of the options you have of course is putting in your game cartridge to either stick at a right angle or at the top of a system or the way that I prefer to do it of having these integrated. All you need to do for that is to make a suitable hole um, to accept the cartridge inside, a nice sort of carrier for it to go and then a way of securing it in the back so that um, you can then push your game in properly and it stays in place as it should. Of course that's not secure down here, which it would do with the pins, but it's just to illustrate that it can look very attractive when the cartridge is uh, internal. When designing the layout for a system, you need to not only make sure that everything will fit, but also looks relatively tidy and that you can get into the system later on for doing any repairs if required. Um, for example, you need to make sure that all the components are secure down, uh, as we've done here with a little bit of plastic. You need to make sure that the wires aren't longer than they need to be, um, not only for prevention of interference on the lines, but also um, it's much easier to close the case as well. Buttons and joysticks. Well, every portable, of course, requires both of these things. Um, and using the stock buttons from a controller has this problem. Some of the buttons are curved. They've done this of course so that the buttons don't over raise above the area that they've made like this. However, it doesn't help much when you're making a system and you want to have the top that's flat. So, rather than having a button that's going to end up looking in that sort of shape, you can either use the style of this, which is a nice flat top, it's the Maco pad or the super pad. Or alternatively, it's a very simple process to make your own buttons. In the example we have on this case, that's exactly what I've done. All, that, all that's required is cutting out some circles of the same size, sanding down the edges so that it's all smooth, and of course painting them. And then behind the area so the button doesn't come out, putting in a tack switch for the contact and putting this onto uh, a piece of cardboard that's very slightly bigger than the button itself. What this means of course is that you can personalize the buttons to be the size that you want. You can also color them to whatever shade that, uh, that you require and they're also nice and flat. The joysticks, well there's a few different options with those. Again, the style of the Maca pad has this quite large but uh, also very accurate joystick. Some joysticks you get can be a sealed unit. Um, however, if we're not going for this larger one that we've just been referring to, it's inside here, another very good option is to use one from a GameCube, just on the basis that they are um, uh, very responsive and you don't get the issues with, um, for example, in Mario games where uh, your character's moving, you don't want them to be tippy-toeing. Uh, I did know this is a PlayStation 1, the GameCube one looks very, very similar, 
and of course when you've mounted the top like this it will sit inside the portable as you've probably seen on quite a few different systems so one option is if there's a space personally I quite like these they might be large but they're also very reliable and they do feel very responsive but it's personal choice D-pads, same principle you can get them um, looking like this which again was from the Maco pad if you want an easier way to cut out a hole some of these have a circuit at the top and of course others are smaller and uh, different shapes whatever is sort of required this again is another example of a slope button so this particular one wouldn't be desirable as you see that side is much um, uh, much less high than this side but there are some which are um, absolutely ideal going through a box of bits and bobs that for example was from a generic uh, GameCube controller there's quite a lot of other examples that you can utilize you have various ways of mounting buttons um, this is an example of one of the various types of boards that you can get this one is quite unique in that the rubber contact that effectively separates the two different contact points as you can see over here well they're molded so that there's a little recess of rubber that goes through to the end of the board keeping this in place this is quite unique because most of the time you just end up when you've opened up a controller with this and a separate contact pad that goes on top that uh, is very hard to secure because rubber doesn't seem to like to be glued um, and stay in place and then of course you have a button on top make sure it doesn't move it around that sort of thing so this is not particularly um, beneficial whereas of course you can cut up this part of the board wire to the traces and utilize this type the alternative is to use rubber topped tact switches which in effect do the same job got a nice mushy feel a nice angle of distance work very well and you can find them in uh, some electronics I mean this was left over I think from an old Sega Master System for the reset button I um, tend to salvage bits like that where possible but these are very cheap to buy only cost a few pence each and they're very ideal for mounting uh, button switches when you want to mount buttons into a case like these for example from the SNES you can cut around the perimeter um, seal inside the unit and then fill up with um, some form of filler like Bondo and uh, sand it down flat however there's a much much neater way of doing the same thing um, you need to always bear in mind that um, you need to line up everything exactly as it is in the system so for example this writing is clearly upside down as it would be because um, this is the inside of the case so if this were on the front it would be in the correct orientation what I do first of all is just to um, pen out with a CD marker pen around the holes that I need to cut out and thereby um, make the holes exactly the right size and in the right position we end up with this the idea being then that once you've mounted your buttons inside the case you've got a very flat top surface and the easy way of doing that is to look again back onto the controller part here we use a very small drill piece about one millimeter would be uh, would be quite sufficient and they cut around the perimeter of um, these um, these button areas uh, sand down as much of this thickness as you can bearing in mind it has to go through the thickness of your new case and then super glue this onto the inside position um, you then end up with the button not being too recessed bearing in mind you've already trimmed this down um, a very good process for doing that is to use a sanding drum from a Dremel get it down as best as you can and then sand the rest of it down flat a little bit of super glue around the edge pop into place and then uh, your button will work properly and you won't have issues with trying to make the case smooth afterwards and this is a particular example when this is finished um, this is going to have the overlay in position like this and as you see it all lines up exactly perfectly here's where I've made a start that's just been cut crudely out from the system and the sanding block you can see how close I've uh, made the cut so I'm going to carry on finishing this off down here and then sand it down and glue it onto the case 
and as a result it's cut so close to the edge that um, any closer than that and the thing would fall apart. All buttons have these little extra ridges that keep the um, button in place underneath the case. You can see them quite clearly here. Well, if those of course have a bit of plastic above them, it's going to mean the button is more recessed. So what we've done here is just to use a knife and cut that part away. Do the same for the other side, it means the button will then stick out as far as it can through the case and yet we've kept the integrity and strength of the side pieces thanks to the super glue. And here's the end result. We put the button in place, turn the system over, you can then see the button sticks out very nicely. When it comes to the D-pad, the same principle applies. Now, this one was mounted on a circle. Um, when that's put into the additional thickness of the case, it didn't leave a great deal of space sticking out for the D-pad to function properly. So, cut out the cross, super glued it onto a piece of uh, perspex, and uh, set about by cutting the uh, hole for the, uh, the D-pad cross by initially putting um, the inverted sample onto the case, drawing it through and then using this small file for the little circles for the corners and um, a straight file for the rest of it. That was after cutting through 90% uh, of it with a drill bit, uh, so about a 2mm one, cut through it very nicely. So of course the idea now is when this is turned around, the D-pad will pop into place and um, be supported in its position and be stuck out quite prominently in the case allowing for easy pressing and um, even height. The example we have here of course was where I made the buttons myself and used those rubber top tack switches and as you see here this is what I was referring to with the back plate being very slightly bigger than the button, and that's a good illustration now of it being pressed. The rubber top tack switch provides the feedback, of course when it's pressed, that's great, makes contact, when it's released the rubber pushes the button back. This is a piece of clear perspex that was just made to, uh, to fit, and uh, held in position by a series of plastic beads, I mean any type of spacing would be fine of course, it's just a way so that you can then ideally screw um, the, the section together so that it sticks down to the case and that if you ever need to do any repairs you can just undo a few screws and get into the system quite easily and uh, change any buttons or anything else that's uh, needing to be repaired. Joystick, well this particular type I've been talking about has a nice plastic rim around it which of course you can then just super glue into place. D-pad, same principle, four tack buttons, spacers, and uh, again screw down into position. Again, when you press it, as you see, you get good contact, feels nice and positive, and when you release, the D-pad goes back into position.